Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you are not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? he asked. Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Matthew 23, the context of our passage is the Lord is saying, Woe unto you Pharisees. Woe unto you religious experts that use your religion to condemn others. Woe to you that are rejecting the Son of God in your midst. You're just like your fathers who persecuted and killed the prophets before you in their day. Now you respect those prophets. You adorn their tombs, but you're just like your fathers. Verse 31, Therefore you are witnesses against yourselves, that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, and now he predicts they're going to be doing the same thing their fathers did. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men and scribes, talking about the leaders of the church are going to begin to evangelize the Roman Empire. Some of them you will kill. Stephen was one of those wise men. And crucify. Peter was one of those crucified. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah whom you murdered between the temple and the altar, or surely I say to you that all these things will come upon this generation. So in their lifetime, they were going to commit these atrocities and be guilty of what their forefathers had done, resisting the hand of God in their midst through his people. And then he turns to the city of Jerusalem. Keep in mind, he's in the temple. He's in the heart of the city. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. 
How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He's identifying himself with the hen that wants to gather her chicks around her when there's danger. I've seen this in action. We lived in Liberia on a mission base in a little place called Fossima in the heart of the jungle, three miles from the nearest, three days walk from the nearest motor road. And a hawk was flying overhead and the mother chickens would cluck, flap their wings and the baby chicks would come under the shelter of the mother's wings. And the hawk's not strong enough to take a mama, so her weight and her size protect the chicks. The rebellious chick is the one that got eaten. And I've seen that too, where a hawk would swoop down and get the one that wasn't under its mother's wings. And so here Jesus is, in light of their impending doom that's going to come 40 years later, 70 AD, and he's weeping for the city for their children. The children, when he's giving this, will be the adults, will be also be adults, when this woe is beginning to be fulfilled. Chapter 24, verse 1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. Now, he had seen the temple. He'd seen the buildings, but maybe there were some unique features that they found interesting. So no doubt they're probably admiring what they're seeing, and Jesus gives them some bad news. Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And it happened 40 years later. And it's still that way to this day. You heard of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem? That's the foundation of this beautiful structure they were admiring. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, which is across the Kidron Valley, where you can see down on the city, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? It's three questions. When will these things be? What things? When, uh, when the people you send are going to be killed and crucified by these guys? When the temple is going to be destroyed? So when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? If you're leaving, when are you coming back? And of the end of the age. Now, some people like to group all these as one question. As I understand it, it's three questions, and he answers all three, but not necessarily in sequence. He answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. No matter what happens, you don't want to be deceived. The problem with being deceived is you are deceived. And when you're deceived, you don't know it. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. I'm the Messiah. Or even, you know, the, the, the name Christ means anointed. I am anointed. There's plenty of people proclaiming their anointing, deceiving folks. I was watching Christian, and I use the term lightly, Christian TV, more than once I saw this guy claiming to be anointed, selling a new anointing times 10 for $2,600. If you want a new anointing, you can get one for $260. If you want one times 10, $2,600. It's like, come on, can't you give me a break? I want 10 of them, right? Deceiving folks, bilking them out of their money. Verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So this is not the answer to the last question. Right? Answer to the questions, but the last question was, when will the end be? The end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This is not just political nations. These are ethnic groups, where nation is ethnos. We can have ethnic division within a nation. And there will be famines, pestilences, or diseases, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. 
Well, haven't these things been going on for centuries? Yes. For centuries, there have been signs pointing, pointing to the answers to these questions. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. I guess when they heard him getting after the Pharisees, they thought, that a boy, Jesus, you tell him. And then, the, oops, we're the guys. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So what's the sign of the end of the age? The whole world hearing the gospel of the kingdom. That has not been fulfilled yet. That's why we support world missions. That's why we rejoice when we hear things like Wycliffe Bible translators saying, translation work on the last languages of the earth for the scriptures will begin within the next 20 years. So we're getting closer and closer to this. Um, and then as he goes on, he talks about the destruction of the temple, how the, the signs that will point to those things he had just predicted. But we don't want to go there. We want to focus on verse 10 through 12. And then many will be offended. Can we say offended? The word there is scandalon. Uh, the Greek word for offense Offended is scandalon or scandalizo. It's related to the word scandal. It means, it means to stumble. It could be a trap. It could be to trip someone up. When you get offended, you get tripped up. Your attention becomes focused on the hurt that you've received. You can get knocked down by being offended. Literally, physically knocked down, but spiritually knocked down. Be distracted from walking in the spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. It could be that certain sins we're not able to somehow get under our feet are not just to be accepted, but it could be it's related to some offense that you don't even think relates. When you let that go, you'll be able to walk in the spirit. Romans 8, those who walk in the spirit will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, right? Right? I'm not talking about sinless perfection. I'm talking about walking in the Spirit free of being offended and knocked down, tripped up, made to stumble, distracted, blinded, as it were, by what has happened to us. Many will be offended. Many. Can we say lots of folks? And will betray one another and will hate one another. Uh, you know, you may have entrusted someone with a big secret. But their character will be tested if they ever get offended at you. Most folks will blab your bad news to the world when they're mad at you. That's betrayal. And they'll even hate you if you offend them. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow If you're offended and hurt, never allow some so-called pro prophet to bring you words of comfort to give you the right to hold on to your offense. Don't do it. Don't do it. While we're called to encourage one another, we're called to encourage one another and exhort one another to good works. And the good works we're talking about today is letting go of our offenses. So, today we open, the Lord willing, a six-week series talking about offenses, the art of letting things go. Can we say that? It's, it's a fight. It's an art. It's a beautiful thing when we let things go so those things don't get a hold of us and drag us down. We're talking about being unoffendable. That doesn't mean offenses don't come, but it means you don't hold on to those offenses. You're Teflon. They don't stick to you. You stay free. How is that possible? Hopefully today will be a foundational word to enable you and I 
to live lives where we're not offended all the time and where we let things go, let it go. God, God paid the debt for our sins and the person I can't stand. So today we're going to talk about the facts, the faith, and the fight. Let's own it. Our facts, our faith, and our fight. First, the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Now, if I speak with great passion, it's not because I'm aware of some drama going on and I'm shooting at somebody. I don't like to do that. That's, that would rob me of sleep. But I've been gone. My father passed. I was out of town for 19 days. Rounded up three weeks. So I am clueless. So I don't have to preach tiptoeing through the tulips. Oop, there's a landmine there. Better be careful there. I'm just going to stomp on those things now. Facts. Opportunities to be offended are real. Jesus said they would be, and they are. In Matthew 18, 7, he said, Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. It's just a reality because of sin. But woe to that man through whom the offense comes. Now, while we're talking about not getting offended, it doesn't mean that we have to impose our walk on others. Well, you shouldn't be offended and just be offensive people. This isn't a call to do that. This is a call what to do with offensive people or offensive situations, to be free. But they're going to happen. They're real. Well, you guys must be immature. Well, maybe we are. Well, I've never been offended. Well, that's great. Awesome. Keep walking it out, brother. But chances are maybe certain offenses haven't happened your way. Opportunities to be offended will be real, and they will be many. We read this. Then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. So if many folks are offended, that's many offenses, right? Many opportunities to be offended. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. We used to say, this is a fatherless generation, but because the love of many growing cold, it's now a motherless generation. So people, just because of lawlessness taking hold in the culture, Romans 1 is in operation. You reject God, God's going to allow all kinds of foolishness to invade you to show your culture there is a God. And so people are abandoning their posts. They're abandoning, they're breaking covenants with one another, betraying one another. It all goes back to lawlessness. Love is growing cold, being displaced with lust. Hollywood, you know, they're changing spouses like you change tires on a car. Well, we just don't love each other anymore. Well, why not? Love is not just something that just happens. It's something you, would, you intentionally practice. It's commitment. Opportunities to be offended will be unavoidable. Not talking about a life free of opportunities to be offended. A life free of anyone committing an offense anywhere around you. That's not real. Luke 17, 1 ends with these words. It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. If you and I just intentionally are offending people, there's going to be consequences for it. It just will. And if you offend a child, that's really bad. Repent quickly. Now our faith. Where, where does our faith come from? It comes from God, right? Saving faith is a gift of God. It's a fruit of the Spirit of God. It's a consequence of God speaking a promise to you. Faith comes by hearing the word of God speak to you. Loving God's word protects us from being offended. It doesn't protect us from offenses coming, but it protects us from allowing those offenses to take root in our life and begin to control us. The psalmist said, Psalm 119, 165, great peace. We say great peace. Amen. Have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Not going to stick. Because the word is having an impact in the lives of those that love it. 
Not loving the word makes us more offendable. It's the opposite way of saying it. Loving God's word keeps us from being offendable. Not loving the word makes us more offendable. In the parable of the soils, Jesus, or the seed, or the sower, Jesus talked about a sower going out to sow the word of God. Some seed fell on the shoulder of the road by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and snatched it up. Some seed fell among stony ground, and because the ground was shallow, the seed began to uh, show signs of life quickly, but then when the sun came, the elements came to bear, it did not bear fruit. Some seed fell on thorny ground amongst the weeds, and because there was competition for nutrition from the soil, it didn't bear fruit fruit. And then some seed fell on good ground, and it bore great fruitfulness. Then he explains the meaning of that. Seed on the wayside is people that allow the enemy to rob the word before it ever takes root in their heart. Good soil, people that hold on to the word that's given to them. People with uh, thorny or weed-filled ground, the word doesn't have preeminence in your life. There's other things that are just as important that rob our life and attention. But seed on stony ground, he explains it like this. When tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. He gets offended. Well, I didn't know if I was a Christian this was going to happen, and you throw in the towel and quit. That word stumble, scandal. He's offended when persecution or trouble comes. When John the Baptist was in prison, he sent messengers to Jesus are you really the Messiah? You know, I was telling folks you're the Messiah. Are you the one? And Jesus gave him the good news, all that was happening. And he ended his good report with these words. And blessed is he who's not offended because of me. John the Baptist had an opportunity to be offended at the Lord. I made the way for you. Look at all these good things that are going on. What am I doing in jail? <laughs> because of his love for his word, that He didn't get stumbled, but the Lord gave him that promise. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Reading Christ's word forewarns us of offenses. We read things like this. These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John 16, 1. These things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. And he goes on to say, why didn't I tell you about these things before? Because I was still with you. Now I'm fixing to leave. Here's some other things you guys need to know before I'm out of here. So that you you don't get offended. All right, so we've talked about the facts. We've talked about the faith. Let's talk about the fight. How do we handle opportunities to be offended? When we have offended, we must fight for peace. When we've offended someone and we know it, we got to fight to be restored. When we don't know it, that person has a responsibility to tell us. Some people have us on such a pedestal, they think we should be omniscient. We should just know everything. But saints, I'm human. If I've offended you in any way, please tell me about it. Tell me so that I can repent and ask for forgiveness and our relationship can be restored so there's nothing between us. Well, you should just know I don't. We all have blind spots that have to be addressed. And so please do your job and confront me. Can you do that? Just not right now. (laughs) Matthew 18, go to your brother alone. A lot of people skip the first step of Matthew 18. Someone offends you, go to them alone. You'll go to everybody else but the person and then tell those people not to tell. What is that? What is that? Reminds me of chickens. Bark, bark, bark. Proverbs 18, 19. A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. It's a fight. Tell me how I made you feel and listen to it so that you can ask for forgiveness, so you can have a grasp. You need to be in touch with people's hurts so that you don't do it again. When tempted to be offended... We must fight against it. Why? Because when we get offended, we become harder to win than a strong city. And our contentions are like the bars of a castle. Who likes to go to prison? Nobody wants to be in prison. The worst thing about jail and prison is the people you're in there with. It's tough. You can't get away from them. Who wants to be grouped in the 
in the fellowship of the offended. Don't want to do it. And finally, when we are offended, you got to admit it, I'm offended, we must fight to forgive. Fight to forgive. Jesus gave some strong words to his disciples in Luke 17. We're going to see it dramatized, and then we'll look at it again, turning your Bibles to Luke 17. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied round their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. He replied, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant ploughing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, Come along now and sit down to eat. Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Luke 17, 1, I'm reading from the New King James. That was from the NIV. He said to the disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. This is the first command he's given in this discourse that we're looking at here. Take heed to yourself. Make sure you don't offend a little one. Make sure you're not an offensive person. And then take heed to yourself what you do when someone offends you. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Now this rebuke isn't like you're rebuking a devil. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. No. You say, brother, that hurts. You're stepping on my ingrown toenails. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Let's talk. You've heard me. You're telling them to stop. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. So take heed to yourselves. And you shall forgive the person that asks for forgiveness up to seven times in a day. In another conversation, one of the disciples asked him about this number seven, so I should forgive my brother seven times? He said seven times 70. Well, seven being a number of completion, it's however many times it takes to forgive, you do it. The disciples said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now, some people think, oh, he changed the subject. They change the subject. You know, that was too hard to hear. Let's talk about faith thing. We want to work signs, wonders, and miracles. No, it's related to this because they found it hard to believe this. Lord, this is hard to believe. That's where they were coming from. Increase our faith. It's not a matter of increasing faith. It's a matter of exercising the faith. We'll talk about how to do that here in a minute. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, mustard seed a little, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be plucked up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now, this is a, a huge metaphor. 
in my mind it is. 1969, my father was voted in as pastor of First United Pentecostal Church in Bloomington, Illinois, on East and Mulberry. They were proud of their location. They used to sing about it. East and Mulberry, that's the place for me. East and Mulberry, that's the place for me. And ironically, the backyard of the church had a mulberry tree, a big one, great shade tree. The mulberries were delicious when, when the fruit season was there. So this is a huge promise. If you had faith like a seed, a mustard seed, you can speak to the mulberry tree, command it to be planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Keep in mind the context. Which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he's come in from the field, all hot and sweaty and thirsty, come at once and sit down to eat? But would he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I've eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink? Now in our Western culture, this is, this is just like, till, what is this? But in this day of servanthood, Servants did what they were told to do. And if a master made an exception, it was his call. But as the master, he had every right to command the servant to do these things. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say we are unprofitable servants, we have done what was our duty to do. So what is our duty? Our duty is to take heed to ourselves. Our duty is to forgive those who've hurt us. Our duty is even to forgive those that don't, that, that don't repent so that we don't get bound up in unforgiveness and roots of bitterness. So what we're talking about here is kindergarten Christianity, basic stuff. Oh, pastor, this is real meat here. No, it's not. This is basics. This is the least of what we're called to do, to forgive people that offend us. Simple. Boy, I don't have that kind of faith. It's not a matter of having that kind of faith. It's a matter of exercising that faith. Here's how it works. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it will obey you. So we have our faith and the words of our mouth. And when we're offended or an offense comes our way, what is trying to take root in your heart, in my heart? Unforgiveness. Hurt. Who likes to stay hurt? It's a sick addiction. I don't want it. Get it away from me. I get offended at being offended. Offended at myself. What he's saying is you can speak to that offense and command it to go and it will obey you. How do you say it with such confidence? Because I've done it. I've had opportunities to be offended and I knew the person didn't mean to be offensive. So I look in the mirror and say, Alan Latta, this is not what it feels like. This is the truth, and I speak the truth, and remind myself of all the facts that counter the lie that's trying to take root in my heart, and I command it to go in the name of Jesus. And I command myself to heed the word, and it works. My daddy died July 1st, and I never really cried, just tear up every now and then, but no real cries because I had so many offenses in my heart and towards him, and I didn't recognize it. This is the scary thing about being a pastor. When you prepare sermons, it's like warfare. Because <laughs> it's, it's got to come from your heart. Otherwise, it's not real. It's just to just get up and you know, read a book or whatever. I was reading a book called Unoffendable by Brant Hansen. I recommend it. It's great. But I can't preach another man's message. I can't preach another man's book. But I get preached to by that, and it inspires me to dig into my own heart, my own life, let God do a work in me. And I began to weep. I was offended at Dad. He's already gone. I'm still holding on to my right to be angry at him. 
I told him he was getting old and he didn't heed my warnings. I read him scriptures and he argued with the Bible. I this, I that, and you know, other stuff. No real childhood stuff. All stuff that happened when I was grown. Uh, he wasn't able to make that transition very smoothly from father of a kid to father of a, an adult. Anyway, so in my repentance, I began to weep and then my back goes out. Well, I'm not blaming the devil for this one, so sorry. You know, somebody saw the devil the other day outside of church crying, said, what's wrong, devil? He said, those people in there are blaming me for everything. <laughs> no, I had this tension so inside of me that it came out, it manifested, and I thought, oh, great, I'm going to be in bad shape for days, and I have to go to a chiropractor or whatever, so I prayed, put an ice pack on it, and in three hours, I was fine. I'm fine today. So it was something there connected to that that showed up in my body when I let the offense go, and it took speaking to it and commanding it to leave. Now, when we talk about art, we think about paintings, we think about beautiful dances and all that. Often, you don't think about art as war, but isn't there a book called The Art of War? It is an art to be a good warrior, to protect your people and to conserve your resources and to be wise. Uh, a, good, a good wrestler is an artist, a good martial arts guy. It's called the arts. It's an art. It's an art of war to live a life where offense doesn't stick to you. Doesn't stick. When Mother Teresa was alive, someone reminded her of something very offensive that had happened to her years earlier. And she turned to the person and said, why are you bringing that up? It was probably one of those, I can't believe they did that to you. One of those, quote, helpful people. You got to watch out for the helpful folks who can't believe what happened to you. Is it, they want to keep you in the hospital or something? She says, why are you bringing that up? I distinctly remember forgetting that. <laughs> well, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. Only God forgets correction. Scriptures do not say he forgets our sin. He says, there's sin I will remember no more. He's omniscient. He knows everything. If he can forget, then that's weakness, right? He's no longer omniscient, right? But he chooses to not remember our sins against us anymore. Amen. So when an offense comes back in our mind, maybe you've let something go years ago and it comes back. It'll come back and visit you. Our minds will do that to us. And I think there can be spiritual powers at work there too. Remember what they did to you? You, know. you can choose to not remember it, not rehearse it, but rebuke it in the name of Jesus and command it to go. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, exercise that faith. Well, pastor, that sounds like word of faith teaching. It is. It's the word and it's faith and you speak the word in obedience to what Jesus said. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. It's not say it and spray it, blab it and grab it, kill it and chill it and claim it and blame it and all that stuff. It's obeying the word in the light of forgiving those that have hurt us. I think I've said enough. I'm an exhorter. I'll say the same thing a thousand times. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the freedom that comes from knowing that you paid our debt. Help us, Lord, to live in light of the fact that you paid the debt of those that have hurt us. Help us, Lord, in the name of Jesus, to recognize the times when we need to speak to stuff trying to hold us back trying to weigh us down, trying to depress us. Let us encourage ourselves in the Lord and gather us with people that will tell us the truth in love and will encourage us and not bring us down in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, not to be those, quote, helpful people, but to be true people of the cross who recognize that you put an end to all our conflicts on the cross so that we can live in Jesus' name.